So I will do my quick hellos and say good morning, everyone. Well, it's not after morning; it's afternoon now, lunchtime. Uh, it's really nice to be to be back. I'm gonna I'm gonna actually um, I'm gonna just start by by praying for our time. Um, we're, we're looking today um, at Matthew five um, twenty seven to thirty seven. Uh, which is a really a, a kind of an exposition of the idea that Jesus already introduced of uh, of the need to be pure in heart. So, so Father, I just want to give the time we've got. Um, Father, purity of heart is one of those things that that's, uh, we'd all want to say is true of us, <laughs> um, but actually it's something that has to be achieved by you, really, in us, um, just to take away those other agendas that complicate matters and, and help us to keep it simple. And so, Father, I just really pray that um, that there'd be uh, there'd be things today that um, little ideas that can be internalised, so we can let go of that those multi layered agendas that we have that kind of get in the way, crowd things out. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. So, um, right, where are we? If I if I move to yeah, there we go. Oh, well, we'll skip past that. <laughs> oh okay yep oh there's a couple more folks have joined since i i shut my eyes to pray <laughs> i didn't actually even pray for extras to turn up so it's really nice to have you here henry nice to have you jason um so we're, we're kind of into the sermon on the mount is that fourth part um i've called it lust lies and broken promises um that that's the kind of title that should get a lot of hits on on youtube um <laughs> As we kind of work through it, but in, in, as I was touching on, just as we we're, we were praying, um, really what what we're beginning to see is, is in this section, Jesus is beginning to expound um, that the concept of being pure in heart, and so he's he's going to address the the issues of um, of how we uh, uh, of. Uh, there's a, there are sexual issues thrown into the mix, <laughs> there are honesty and integrity issues. Um, and, uh, and 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 there is a real sense in which there's a kind of a flow from last week, um, even though we're moving on in terms of the beatitude from um, from blessed are the peacemakers to blessed are the pure in heart. There is a kind of a, a, a continuous kind of flow. Um, we we so some of what we looked at last week we'll find has some relevance um, into the the process as we're thinking about it. So if I if I come back to the text or we come to the text. And um, where we got to, it just starts like this. So, so you've heard how it was said. So, so that phrase, of course, was how J- Jesus opened up the breast of the peacemaker section. You've heard how it was said, "You shall not commit murder," whereas in this case, it's "You shall not commit adultery." So, so Jesus is is framing it within the context of the law of Moses, um, as we we've seen right from the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. There's a kind of a paralleling and drawing on that. It's something about this message. Um, but I would say to you that anyone who looks at a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her, with her in his heart. Now that that's a quite a strong sort of statement. <laughs> now it, it's really important to notice what Jesus does and doesn't say in this mix. Um, he he also this is is always one of these things. It's kind of you know we're we're, we're so um, as, as being English and or British most of us I think here. We did have someone who kind of logged in from um, from Australia once upon a time, didn't we? <laughs> but being being very British, we don't like to talk about sex, you know. <laughs> but this one makes it even worse. We're talking about sex, and we're we're also talking about gender differences. So it's suddenly, for me as a male, it makes it quite awkward because Jesus actually is addressing his dominant culture, which is a which is a male way, um, a, 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 and and that. Um, you get into trouble nowadays for me saying there's any differences between the, the sexes, but there are. Um, so um, I, 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 like I said, I, I make a joke about this. I, some of you will know, um, obviously, we're, 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 I'm working through the Sermon on the Mount in much more detail from a psychological point of view in, in an evening program at the moment. Um, <clears throat> the first time I ever put it together, I, did, I went and did some research on the Internet, sex on the Internet, which is one of those things you don't want to confess to if you're, <laughs> if you're in Christian ministry. Oh, yeah, I was researching sex on the Internet the other day. <laughs> Um, but what, what, there are real differences in terms of consumption and in terms of the because men are visu- tend to be more visually stimulated. Um, but as it turns out, not uniquely so, but they tend to be more so. <clears throat> um, just to kind of, although that's not really, we're, we're really looking at, at Jesus' intention here, but just to kind of complete that little cycle. So, you know, what I was thinking of is just that, that it's it's um, it's very interesting in terms of um consumption of of what is supplied visually to kind of to kickstart those desire circuits within us 
um, that um, mo it, as a big surprise to the researcher, one of the things they found was there were differences between men, women, and women who are, who are hormonally modified by being on the pill. Um, so you actually have three kind of categories. Um, and um, and actually, the, the consumption of visual images for, for kind of a pleasurable purposes, what they found was is men actually spend most time looking in the face and the eyes, which actually I found kind of encouraging. <laughs> um, that actually the, 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 the naked parts are often kind of trigger in the brain that, that, that there's someone is being intimate, but they want to, they want to confirm that intimacy by looking into the face. Uh, which I thought was really kind of an interesting sort of uh, a sort of observation. Um, interestingly, when when um, when women um, are confronted with pornographic images, um, they actually their eyes are drawn to the surroundings, um, the soft furnishings, and you can actually see the kind of the, the the agendas that are at play in this. That that deep down there is a desire for connection in men even though it will kind of gratify and be kind of stimulated by things that they're seeing and looking at and so on. Similarly in women who may, but they're also, they're, they're instead of the connection, they're looking for security. So they're observing how, how kind of, uh, how safe and secure the environment is. And you can understand those, those sexual priorities in one sense, but, but actually it is a powerful thing. And the, the Jesus kind of picks up this idea, you know, you're not supposed to commit adultery, but I would say to you, anyone who's looking at a woman for lusting after her is already committing adultery with her or committed adultery with her in his heart. And so very similar way to we saw last week with um, with with uh, murder and anger. Um, Jesus pushes it right the way to the internal process rather than the, the, the external fruit, the action. The action might be murder, but it starts with anger. Um, the the action might be about adultery, but actually it starts with with actually how much do we play around on the edge in terms of what we entertain? Is that I can look at a, a woman, but if I look on her to lust for her, lust for her, I'm entertaining a process in my head, which actually leads me to a very primeval drives like anger does. Um, if you if you think back to um, Genesis. Um, and God creates mankind in his image, he makes him. And he says, be fruitful and multiply for which you need sex and, and have dominion for which you need some form of aggression. And we're addressing those two things right up front. We've had aggression in the Sermon on the Mount in that you, 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 you know you're not supposed to commit murder, but actually there's something in your heart that actually where the aggression is growing, you know you're not supposed to commit adultery, but you're quite willing to play around with areas in terms of your, the way you allow your imagination to go to drives in you that are very fundamental to humanity. Um, you need sex and you need aggression to be fully human the way God made you. It's not the fact that it's there or not, it's how it's managed, how you use it, how you shape it. And so Jesus draws attention to that and uh, and. Um, with the Sermon on the Mount, we have in Precy something that's much more deep, but I think it is the nature of of how we we work out the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount, that we share wisdom one to another. So the disciples have to take this agenda forward. <laughs> um, and also the Holy Spirit guides us. The key thing to notice here is that Jesus draws attention to it. There's something about how we entertain our inner lives um, that actually is where the start of these things grows from. Um, so we, we find in that similar way, I quoted this last week because remember we looked at um, how in the Talmuds we have recordings of an earlier context and earlier conversations, which I, I would suspect are part of the context that Jesus is teaching in where the probably the Sanhedrin, it, actually this is the kind of the logic where they've got to. So when he, he last week we saw he posited, you know, you risk judgment generally because you're you're blowing off anger you know if you go around blowing off anger unnecessarily you risking judgment you risk the sanhedrin and the sanhedrin have taught that actually if you call people names and so on then you go to gehenna so actually if you stood before the sanhedrin and you've actually done it they're likely to say you're now now liable to gehenna we saw that thread so i put this little quote back up anyone who descends to gehenna um, ultimately ascends so Gehenna is okay it's survivable as long as you don't do one of these things except for those who descend and don't ascend and these are the one who engages in intercourse with a married woman so now we're on adultery so um, but it's not just got the word adultery it's more specific he's having intercourse with a married woman 
um, as this is a transgression, it's a serious offence both to God and to a person, <laughs> i.e. the husband. So this is the way that the, the rabbis are thinking about it. So actually you, you're liable to Gehenna and you don't get out of Gehenna if you, because actually intercourse was, he said don't, don't commit adultery and actually not only that, you've offended the person as well. So you've offended two people, so you're stuck. Which you can see is really a kind of a, a way of, of leveraging their power structure. Um, as this is a, so this is a serious offence both against both God and the person and the other people who don't get out of Gehenna are the ones who humiliate in public and who call others a derogatory name, which we saw covered last week. So Jesus is talking in this context, um, but he takes it a little bit further. So you know you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> you know that you're not supposed to commit adultery. Um, the Sanhedrin, in the same way, same framework, um, who you 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 risk things for? They agree with that, and they're actually saying, you know, you're going to get stuck in Gehenna. You won't get out. <laughs> um, and then Jesus goes on, and so he so he he kind of uh, um, adopts. Uh, he he says that that's fine, but that's the that's the um, that's the final consequence. But actually, these things start in your heart. Um, now he he doesn't say that they're equivalent. Um, I have actually heard it said that way. I've had, actually heard this presented, that they're just the same. Jesus doesn't say they're the same. Um, if you if you uh, if you if you have not got any kind of level of self control in your thought life, <laughs> um, but you have at least got the control not to not to commit adultery, you won't do as much damage. That in that sense, socially it is more damaging if you you don't. But what Jesus is drawing our attention to is that actually. There's something that's only about fear of, of judgment, fear of the authorities, fear of getting it wrong because the culture is like that. But actually in secret and in private, I'm quite happy to entertain thoughts like this. Um, and, and he draws attention to that and then kind of takes it a step further. Um, so he says, if and, and so now um, to kind of put it in modern terms, um, uh, Jesus is effectively saying that this is quite serious, really. If you've got, if you, you know, the all sorts of evil kind of flows out of those thought lives. But so, if your eye, eye causes you to stumble, pluck it off and throw it away. Um, he's using hyperbole. Um, almost everybody, right the way from through early church history to the modern day, sees Jesus speaking with hyperbole. Except, strangely, in some modern churches, where where people try and. Uh, there, there's a tendency to try and see this as, as kind of almost as literal as possible in in certain extreme places. Um, the the um, it, it's it, it, there is a, there is some argument that that Origen may have taken it a little bit more literally, <laughs> but almost everybody recognises you find it in the rabbinic way of te- um, hyperbole is a way of teaching in in rabbinic circles. So it's illogical because if your right eye causes, you pluck it out and throw that away, but your left eye is just as capable of seeing and just as able to imagine. It's much more hyperbolic. It's saying, do something in your context. (laughs) If your thought life is out of control, do something in your context to make it less likely to go wrong. If your right hand causes you to stumble, so you started with imagination and now... And that's that comes in through the eyes. The eyes are the kind of the source of imagination. Jesus will pick that up later in the Sermon on the Mount when he talks about your eye being good or not. Um, so you, you, there's something about try to cut off the imagination. If your right hand causes you to stumble, i.e., I reach out to do something about this. I reach out to grab. I'm stepping across a line. What started in my heart because I've not found discipline in the way I think in terms uh, sexually in terms of things. I've entertained the imagination. Now I start to act on it. My hands are now getting involved. If I can put it those ways. Um, then it's better if you lose one part of the body than the whole of you goes to Gehenna. Again, that Gehenna reference is because actually that's the way the judgment is understood. Um, this is what you should be fearful of if you actually get into the place of adultery. Um, and the way I put that, the, the last line, you'll see some translations will put depart for Gehenna. Um, th- th- um, it really the, the the Greek word that's used there is much more you're on the journey so you can kind of see there's a progression you're thinking about it now you're acting on it and now th- because you're acting on it you're on you're on the journey to actually doing something that's going to get you in trouble that the Sanhedrin have already said you go to Gehenna and you don't get out <laughs> 
Um, and so this is this in one sense is Jesus acknowledging the framework that he's in rather than producing new teaching. So the new little bit he's going to kind of um, he's going to touch on here. We're going to find it's actually unpacked again in Matthew and also in Mark's gospel when it comes down to the high value Jesus puts on on marriage. So we have we have the context of imagination, which leads to action, which leads then to judgment, which is quite severe in the context Jesus is talking in. And, and then Jesus draws things in to what's a very current debate, which is really quite fascinating. <laughs> um, he said, um, it's also been said, um, whoever divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. OK, so that's that's in that's there in Leviticus. Um, it's there in the law of Moses um, in its day. The certificate of divorce um, was a radical um, benefit to the woman. Um, we, we've lost the context of that because in the modern world we see oh, how terrible the husband can give his wife a certificate of divorce really easily. But actually the point was all of the other cultures around didn't have to bother with the certificate. A husband could just divorce his wife by telling her and kick her out. Um, and actually this was quite socially, this was quite tragic because now the wife is in an ambiguous state. Is she married or not? So what, what Moses requires is that this is a public thing that has to be worked out through the synagogue leaders or through the judge the judges that he sets up. There are no synagogues in Moses' day. You have to come to a judge, you have to explain it, you have to get a, a certificate, and you give it to the wife. <laughs> and, and the certificate, and this is important here because one's been dug up, Some we've actually got an, an example of what's in the certificate, actually states that she has been divorced and is free to remarry. Um, the reason I, I mention that is because the church has got all very focused on you can't remarry after divorce because they've misunderstood the context in which Jesus is speaking. Um, they don't understand that they, or they, until about 100 years ago, we didn't fully understand it. And now, although we understand it, unfortunately, the church hasn't changed its mind on some of these things. Um, so the certificate that is actually given is actually an incredible liberation to the woman because she has now got formal proof that she's been divorced and therefore she is free to remarry. It actually states it on the on the divorce certificate. <laughs> um, so that was a, a real benefit. So you know that that's what you're supposed to do. But here's the confusing bit, because this is a really current debate that hits the, the years that Jesus is ministering in. But I would say to you that everyone divorcing his wife, except on account of sexual immorality, coerces her to commit adultery. Um, the, the coerce is, is actually the, the Greek word you often see makes her commit adultery, but there's you can use it in various ways. So I, I quite like that you're, you're pushing her down a line where she's going to have to. Now, why does Jesus say that when the divorce certificate says she's free to remarry? Whoever marries her has been divorced and commits adultery. And the reason he is is because a new level of divorce certificate has come in in the, the previous few years, just before Jesus is ministering. Um, and it goes back to a debate between two um, two, two um, Jewish rabbis. So the, the, there's the school of, of um, Hillel, um, which Paul is part of, because he was trained by Gamaliel, who was part of that school. Um, and there's the, tool, there's the school of Shammai. And, and most of the time, um, it seems that in, Hillel is much more kind of open, and it's the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. Shammai is much more legalistic and hardline. So, for instance, they would tell a story about um, a, a, a God fearer who comes to, to Shammai and says, I want to I want I want to become a proselyte. Can you teach me the law? And, um, and, and can you teach me the law simply while I stand on the leg? And, and Shammai hits him with a stick. So he falls over and says, no, basically get lost. <laughs> um, and Shammai teaches that, that, that actually even if even proselytes, they still don't inherit um, the next life. They don't actually benefit. They can only they can have the privilege of being a proselyte, getting circumcised, keeping Jewish law, but then they don't get any benefits in the afterlife. So he's quite a hard line of Shammai. Hillel is a bit more. There's a there's a mission to the Gentiles. We need to interpret the spirit of the law. And so in a lot of ways, people say, oh, Jesus looks like a Hillelite. But interestingly, on the matter of divorce, they're the other way around. So on the matter of divorce, the Hillelites take the phrase where it says, if a man finds any indecent matter in his wife, then he can divorce her. And they 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 say, well, indecent could be anything. See, it's so open. The spirit of the law could be absolutely anything. <laughs> 
Um, whereas the Shamites say, no, when that word was originally used, it meant sexual immorality. It meant she was sleeping around, you see. So, so the Shamites are actually saying you can't divorce your wife unless there's actually been an adulterous relationship. Whereas the Hillelites were saying that you can do it for any matter. If you don't like her, she's get a bit old, she's got a bit worn out. It's, you find that indecent, you find it offensive. You can, you can get your certificate of divorce. And so they had actually come up with the, the Jewish equivalent of an, well, they, what they think of as an any matter divorce. So you remember it in the other passage in Matthew. Can a, can a man divorce his wife for any matter? <laughs> this is the contentious word, any matter. Is it any matter or is it, is it actually, a, a, is it actually um, immorality? So here Jesus is, is siding with Shammai. You see that? He's, 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 he's actually, because he's actually saying, because the thing, the thing was, this happened about 30 years before Jesus comes along. The Shamites um, have all of the power and all the control. Most of the Pharisees in Jesus' day are Shamites. Um, in, in Jerusalem, they're Shamites because Shammai puts a strong emphasis on the temple. Um, and the, um, and the, the, the temple, of course, is there in Jerusalem. <laughs> um, and so it likes to support that, that line. So the hardline Pharisees, if you like, are the Shamites, and, and they're the dominant ones who are often opposing Jesus. We often find Jesus in his debates when we hear about the Pharisees. He quotes back things that are much more in line with Shammai in terms of criticism. Um, so the Shamites, for instance, had developed the system whereby you could bequeath or tie your money for when you die as, be, as going to the temple. Um, but by doing so, that meant you couldn't use your money for other obligations like looking after your parents. You remember Jesus addresses that issue. So the Shamites were very tied up with the temple. So in Jesus' day, his, his, the group of Pharisees that were opposing him the most were the Shamites. Um, but on this, he actually sides with them because he's saying, you know what, the, the kind of di divorces that the Hillelites are having are not proper divorces. If you, you divorced your wife because she got a bit old and you wanted to trade her in for a younger model, that's not legitimate. And what you're forcing your wife to do is because you've, you've divorced her illegitimately, therefore you're forcing her to behave in those more immoral ways, you know. So he, he's, he, 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 Jesus takes a high view of marriage, <laughs> you see it that way, um, he sides with the Shamites, but actually they're often the ones who are in opposition to him. The strange thing that happened, so this is kind of going a little bit out of the text, but giving a bit of history, is as you move, as the Gospels are being written, um, because a, a, a lot of um, a, a lot of people, um, a lot of scholars will say, ah, the Gospels weren't written until after the fall of the um, the fall of the temple, because after the fall of the temple, the Shamites sort of disappear and everyone is a Hillelite because there's no temple anymore. So it loses its power and authority. Um, so so a lot of but but even before the fall of the temple, where Hillel is stronger is in the diaspora. So as the gospel goes out, the early church, when it's competing with as a Jewish kind of movement, um, the people it's competing with are often Hillelites. Um, and so you found a strange thing where both groups are opposed to Jesus in different ways. The, the Shamites are in Jesus's lifetime of ministry based in Jerusalem. As the gospel starts to go out and then after the fall of Jerusalem, the opposition tends to come from the Hillelites. And so in, in the New Testament itself, it doesn't bother making a distinction between the two. Uh, and I just mentioned that because some scholars say the fact it doesn't means that it must have been happened. All of this must have been written after the fall of the, the temple. That's a step too far, really. You can't really say that because actually in their different contexts, both of them become opposed <laughs> to Jesus. But Jesus is interestingly, therefore, this, that's why I wanted to get across here is he's steering a middle line. He's, he's doing the spirit of what the law is about, but the law is still serious. So you're not supposed to commit adultery. Um, there, there are arguments in the Talmuds whereby they actually people work out that it's not really adultery if she's a slave or she's actually someone who's kind of now a divorced woman. So she's not actually married to someone because she's been divorced and she's got a divorce certificate. So if I've had sex with her, it's not really adultery. So that's OK. I've avoided Gehenna. This kind of legalistic sort of wordplay <laughs> Um, is kind of just getting in the way, which is why Jesus kind of f focuses it on, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on in your heart. That's what we've got to sort with. That's what we've got to deal with. Anyway, I need to keep an eye. Oh, I'm, I'm going on too long. So I let me. <laughs> so again, you've heard it said previously, you shall not swear fake promises, but you'll keep your oaths to the Lord. 
But I would say to you not to swear at all, either by heaven, because it's God's throne, or by earth, it's his footstool, or Jerusalem, or the city of the great king. Nor should you swear by your head, for you can't make a single hair white or black. And and although this seems very different, it's about this. The, the reason I've, I've said this is an exposition of the idea of the pure in heart is that the, the kind of sophistry that is being used by the rabbis of Jesus's day for how, the, how they conduct themselves sexually so that they don't put themselves across the line. And I've committed adultery, not just committed adultery, but with, with a woman who's currently married to somebody else. That's what I get in trouble for. <laughs> you see that kind of that sort of level of legal it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like the the Bill Clinton kind of statement. You know, I did not have sex with that woman. Well, technically, no, no, it wasn't what you might call mechanically. <laughs> but but it's kind of that's just it's sophistic, sophisticated argument is kind of playing with words and missing the spirit, missing the kind of the emotional content, missing the the fact that this is what's kind of going on in the heart. And how similarly G Jesus focuses on another manifestation, which is how we swear and so people, it's kind of like, well, I'm obligated, as we hear about elsewhere in the gospel, I'm obligated because I swore by the temple. Oh, that's not good enough. I'm obligated because I swore by the gold that's in the temple. That if we're kind of starting to work like that, which is it only counts if I've sworn like this, then actually there's something just wrong with your integrity. <laughs> we, we need to drive back. Yes, you may not commit adultery because you're fearful of, of the judgment and Gehenna, um, but actually there's something that goes on in your thought life and 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 it's not that that we kind of sit here and go oh my goodness I, I've got to kind of I, I failed because almost every man and probably most women as well will find their thought life gets driven all over the place in the culture that we live in at the moment it's more to say but this is something that I want to kind of make accountable to the Lord and to the Holy Spirit I want to keep this open to his uh, his change and transformation and similarly with truth that I don't want to get sophisticated in terms of well it's okay here um, because um, the, the, uh, the the actual uh, as we, we do on the um, in the evening sessions I'm doing at the moment when you look at the psychology of it when you have that level of sophistry um, you actually find it um, you will almost always give in to temptation if you can get rid of that layer of sophistry it's just a settled matter if the matter is settled I'm now married to this person, so I'm not entertaining thoughts anywhere else. If that once that's settled in you, what you find is you you could you um, temptation is not so extreme. You just don't really struggle with it. Um, if you haven't settled that issue internally, um, then you're put into a context that creates temptation, and you can actually see it in the brain. It, it operates in a different level but in different people. Um, some people when they get married settle the issue and they, they there's not a temptation going on in the brain and that um, others don't and when there is a temptation the truth is at some point they're going to fail that makes sense <laughs> so Jesus is actually very modern and correct in his thinking if we don't address those desires internally first there'll always be a point where we cross the line and, and we feel oh no I got it wrong similarly with honesty if I have situations where I think it's okay to lie, I will always struggle with, is this okay to lie at this point? And therefore, there will always be a point where, for whatever reason, because I'm a bit tired or whatever, I cross a line that I don't want to cross. And actually, now it's all come back to bite me. If we can just resolve in ourselves, I don't, I always try and tell the truth. To the best of my abilities, I always tell the truth. So I'm not going to be tempted by how to do it. I'm not going to overstate and because when I get like that, then I have to convince you that I'm being truthful. So I, 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 you know, I cross my heart and spit and swear upon the grave of my mother. It's a line from a Dire Straits song. <laughs> you know, it's um, we we kind of become extreme because we're trying to to project into an immoral world. Um, but both of them, are, as I say, are, are issues which you can actually see in in, in um, using an fMRI scanner and putting people in situations and challenging them, tempting them effectively. That those who have settled those issues, who have dealt with it internally, can, kind of actually kind of come through that with parts of the brain just not activating at all. Um, people who don't are buzzing all over the place and they may at some point they're going to step over and make the mistake that they don't want to make because they've entertained a process in the brain 
um, without bringing any constraint to it. So it, I've, I've taken too long probably this, this, today. We're taking a bit longer than we should, but I, I, I found it fascinating both the, in terms of the the, the use of language, um, the, the, the putting some sort of place and control around my thought life, um, which actually um, some of that is allowed because now suddenly we're in a situation where, you know what, you can divorce and trade up your wife at any old time. The fact that I'm in a place where divorce is now so trivial, this is Jesus' context, means that my even my disciples, because they say that when Jesus, when Jesus says how marriage should be, they say, oh, that's a bit tough. Perhaps it's better not to get married. What they're actually saying is we've grown up in a context where we're, if, I, if I don't like my wife, I can, I can trade her in really easily, really quickly. If you take that on board, you've never really settled that this is your life partner and you're more likely to do something that's hurtful and painful. Do you see the see the process? So in a funny sort of way, um, <laughs> rather, yeah, let your, your affirmation of yes mean yes and no mean no. Anything more than this implies evil. It's the way it finishes. <laughs> um, that there's an awful lot that we kind of have to express. We The lady doth protest too much. We have to say so much because there are these internal struggles. Um, and you can see a very kind of clear sense in the Sermon on the Mount that that wants to take us just from judging based, based on the actions to say, to really understand what's going on, we have to kind of look into the heart. We want to see these re issues resolved down there. If they're resolved down there, they're not so likely to cause a problem out here. So um, it seems like an odd place to cut off, <laughs> but we're going to move on to, to, the, to another little section, another little um, exposition in the next week. Um, does anyone want to ask anything or, or make any comments into this? Go on, Julian. Yeah, two things. I was desperate to know what Anne's brain was thinking. Um, I've, I've got, <laughs> I've, I've got three, um, three sisters and a very determined family, as you know, Kristen. Um, the two things that came up for me was that you know it's it's desperate. The Bible's desperately unfair towards women in today's context, um, or any context, to be honest. And I really struggle with God in the Bible in the respect that, you know. Unfortunately, a lot of ministers have taken Bible and Scripture and used it in such a kind of powerful way, which whilst it says, yes, if you're holy as thou, the, 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 the woman will actually oh, just fall at your knees and there'll be a, this spiritual blessing between you in relationship. So that's one area, which I know that's probably a longer answer to that. But the second part was that I think that you're, you're talking about marriage and the concept of marriage, and, and but... I think the fuissance of people going out into the world are just living, trying to live their life with, with this sexual urge, sexual stuff that we have got. I think if we're going to get it right with God, you'll end up actually doing nothing. So I, it's just a real difficult one, isn't it? There's that sort of what does God think about you and how you're doing your stuff? And how do we actually come off as decent, sensible Christians or shining in the Jesus light. It's not easy guys, is it? That's, that's why I wanted to throw yeah. out. No, and I, I think the, so I think um, to, to kind of give you a quick response, that's partly why I was in the drive in the, the actual psychological evidence is um, and there is a, there is, and it's actually one of the things that again, seems to be to work with the genders particularly mm -hmm. is that, um, that, that actually men, when they feel like they're in a searching mode, um, are far more likely and far more open to temptation and crossing lines with multiple partners and so on. There is a there is a there is something that happens though with some people, not everybody, that when they say this is my life partner, it actually changes a, a it, there's an actual kind of a physiological change, which you can actually measure. That's what I was driving at. Okay. Um and, and actually it becomes so things become less of a temptation. And I would say in my own marriage, I went through that experience, you know. That actually you find your mind chasing possibilities a lot less once you have made that positive decision this is the person and so that seems to be actually part of human physiology and so secular psychology will actually identify that some people are less prone to temptation because they've made that flip but if you live in a context where you you've kind of am i married or not which is i think the context jesus is in when he says this because actually you've got an easy divorce. I, I just don't like her anymore. That's a good enough reason. So I can go and get a divorce. It's casual. I can. So so suddenly the imposition has gone. So people get married with the idea of, well, if it doesn't work out, I'll sort it out. They never actually achieve that peace, if you like. Similarly, we're telling the truth, which is why it's there. 
Um, if you if something has clicked in you that says, well, I'm an honest person, what you find is the temptation to lie is not so much there. If you if you try and be honest because the, of the context, <laughs> then then there's a struggle. What you find is those people. I've got a nice little video, um, which in the um, if you've done the evening things I'm doing, um, I've you can watch with with a guy who's not a Christian. He's an atheist psychologist. Um, and um, and and he explains that he says, you know, you can actually see it in the scans. You can see the argument going on in the brain. Am I going to tell the truth or not? Here, you got a similar thing goes on. So you need to settle something in you, and that is to a degree possible. Um, it's it's actually quite hard when you've not made the commitment anywhere. So when because it's kind of like your brain is more free for all. I'm looking for a life partner, so therefore my brain is more geared for entertaining thoughts. Um, it's only when you kind of choose it and it settles and, so, and not all men do because some people get married but they've always kept it open if that makes sense <laughs> that kind of flips down and actually it's less of an internal struggle um, and I think that's really where Jesus is driving now uh, to the degree of, of things like um, how does the Bible treat women I, th there's a kind of a, a constant flip side the New Testament has more significant women in it than any other religious text in the world um, you know, you run through names of people it commends, um, Eunice, Phoebe, um, uh, 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 Damar Damaris, um, Lydia, um, the honourable lady that refers to, his, and it actually it's full of, of, um, of women who've got positional authority. And the thing that we, we often miss, but if you've seen Bethany Hughes, the, the, um, she's a feminist historian, she says the thing that the modern world misses is what good news the, gospel, the Christian gospel was for women in Roman culture, where in Roman culture and in Greek culture they were nothing more than, than sex machines, and now, now they had status. It's just we look at it from the modern world with, with slightly archaic translations, some of which have not been good translations. This is a long question to say. <laughs> Um, and and it and and we we miss it's a bit like I said we miss the fact that the divorce certificate was actually very good for the woman when it was given. We now look at it and go, oh, well, that sounds a bit bad. A husband can give his wife a certificate of divorce, but the context it was given into is that a husband could just kick his wife out and tell her, and her status is ambiguous. Nobody will remarry her because she might actually already be married, and nobody's really clear. So it was actually a very liberating thing when it was given. But from from where we stand, um, a feminist can look at it and say, how patronising. <laughs> um, but it doesn't really understand the reality of the context that the world is dealing with, the, you know, the text is dealing with, if I put it that way. I think your forensic bit with the chemicals in the mind and stuff, uh, uh, Christian, are very helpful because I, I think the feeding thing, feeding thought, I think that's quite that's the takeaway I've got from today, which has been yeah. really helpful. And I just think I just sometimes struggle, I guess, with how the Bible was, how we're meant to go to the Bible to say, oh, there's the instruction. Oh, I've got it now. Oh, I better do it the Bible way. But I think we've kind of moved on from the, the darkest times of the uh, Old Testament. But it's just it's just a shame Jesus wasn't living. Around, yes, I could say spiritually is, but it would be great to have Jesus to say, hey, we're in the 21st century. This has happened. Women have got a bit stronger since the old days. And this is the context. So explaining the context now with an old yeah. narrative is quite an interesting um, crossover, if you see what I mean. Yeah, I mean, I, the, the thing I think is, it, which is an interesting thing just to, to balance out, which is there's no ancient text um, in the world. Well, the, the Bible as an ancient text is unique. There's no other text like it in the entire world, and there never will be, <laughs> um, in the sense of how long it goes back and how many different authors and how it's been pulled together and so on. But there's no ancient text that is best known um, through eyes of limited scholarship, if I can put it that way. So it, it can sound a bit patronising, but most ancient texts have been studied by people who, who study not just the words, and not just the, but actually the whole context. But the, the, the Christian church is often led by people who've got a university degree, but maybe in maths or maybe whatever. And then they've come and they've, they've often read... And they haven't been taught how to take the full perspective in and they've passed that on. And so you end up with a church that has a narrative which is kind of broadly true, but is being shaped not necessarily with the best thinking. And if the thinking is higher level, it's often been critical and is negative. So sadly, we don't have, if you like, the an approach to unpacking the Bible that actually explains context 
Um, and, and that's partly what I'm doing here today, is I'm pointing out to you, here's some quotes from the Talmud. And before you got the Talmud, you got the, the Mishnah, which includes the dialogue between Shammai and Hillel. And actually, we can see reflections from in both of those sources that Jesus is speaking into. And that slightly modifies even our understanding of what Jesus is saying, where he puts the priority, when we understand the context he's speaking into. So I don't disagree with the fact that actually with the loss of that context, we sometimes have a slightly a slightly broad brush picture of, of the nuances in Jesus' teaching and that that can be used for leverage and so on. Um, I think it's part, it will always have been the case. That will always just be the, the reality. <laughs> Um, there, there is never, you know, the, the, there, there is never something that will change with each culture to kind of change its wording to try and explain. You have to have a level of kind of, of, of study and scholarship to try and give it that context. So, thank you. Brilliant. Anyone else want to comment or ask anything? But just one thing: I was, the, the two Jewish schools. How yeah. Well is, how, how do you spell them, Kristen? As a so Hill, just... Hillel is H I L L E L. Yeah. Um, and Shammai is S H A M M A I. So just say that again S H A M M S H A M M A I. Shammai. Thank you. Hillel and Shammai. So, and, and as I say, most of the time you will see Jesus kind of tends towards Hillel, the Hillel school, which was the smaller school in Jerusalem at the day when Jesus is teaching. Um, but actually becomes the dominant school in the diaspora when the gospel is going out, which is why, as I say, they both schools in the end get into conflict, which is probably why the New Testament just doesn't bother to distinguish between them, <laughs> um, because they, the, the, the rabbis, are, because they, they were competing as a missionary movement. Hillel's movement was more missionary, um, which was really useful because the gospel came in and there, was already, there were already mission-minded Jews who were reaching out. Um, which meant, of course, the Hillelites then didn't like the, the new church because it was different. Jesus isn't the same as Hillel. He he doesn't always agree with Hillel, but he's more in spirit. <laughs> so you got you got there for the Hillelites falling out. So so in the end, you can say there's no point distinguishing the two, two groups of Pharisees because in different ways they both opposed <laughs> um, Jesus and the church, if I can put it that way. But you can see certain nuances where on this side Jesus lines up here and this way he lines up there. So Okay, so they they were both groups of Pharisees as opposed yep. to these Oppo opposed to being Sanhedrin, yeah. So they were two major schools within the in the Pharisees. And um the um the, and as I say, the, the 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 dialogue between them is mainly kind of captured in the, it's about the second century, the Mishnah. So the Mishnah captures their dialogue. It happens about thirty years before Jesus, so it's literally the generation before. Um, Gamaliel was of, of the school of Hillelites, um, and he trained Paul. So you can see some of um, some of Paul's openness is probably driven. Um, it's probably been in count, He's probably been trained by a missionary type school, the Hillelite school, um, as a young man. So, um, and so th there, there are lots of areas where you see Jesus aligns himself with Hillel, but goes further in terms of, um, we'll, we'll see that a bit more as we go through the weeks. Um, he aligns with Hillel, but goes a little bit further. But uh, strangely on this one, he's, he's sort of more with Shammai, which is actually it was only supposed to be adultery that you're getting divorced for when you're just making it a casual thing. It's kind of just a way of making it into a religious way of doing adultery. <laughs> you know, I've fallen out with her. I want to go. I want to. I want to be. I want to be with somebody else. So I've gone and got a certificate in any matter divorce. I've made up my reasons. Here it is. Got my divorce. Kick her out. Get somebody new in. Um, well, in which case you just. It's just like you kind of forcing your partner to go and. Uh, so I was about to be slightly overly crude there, but you you get the <laughs> you get the impression. Is there a quality of paper on this certificate, just in case it's needed in the future for me? I mean, is there a particular type of quality of paper, or can you do it by email? <laughs> yeah. So somebody once did one on a on a lump of clay which we built up, which is which has been dug up, which is how we know the wording on it. You know, with the um, yeah. <laughs> Can, can I ask Anne, uh, uh, Kristen? Sorry, Anne. I know this is a bit bizarre and uh, probably against uh, Kristen's protocols. Um, as a as a female, obviously, um, what what are your thoughts? Uh, do you have a flavour on this style of you know when teachers, mainly men, in the past and now, 
what are your well not now to a certain extent but what are your feelings from a female's perspective because i'll be interested to hear your thoughts i think i've been very lucky because although when i first became a christian it was in a fairly trad evangelical anglican church um when i after i've encountered the holy spirit it's very quickly after that i moved to london and then i was in Ipthus, and then i was in river where Kristen was leader for half the time anyway. So, so the, the environment that I've been in for most of my Christian life has been one that's been very affirming of women. Yeah. So I think I've just been quite, quite fortunate from that point of view. Yeah. Well, it's really refreshing, Kristen, because I think a lot of ministers wouldn't dare go down a full examination, an autopsy of what does this mean and allow people to share that. I mean, that is really, that, that's really helpful because, you know, there's a tendency to say, well, it's in the Bible, let's move on. And nobody yeah. gets anywhere. So, so yeah. I wanted to thank you for that. No, no. Good. Well, we've, we've gone way over what we normally said we'd good to go over on this one. <laughs> thank you very much for sticking around. We've stuck around so much that, that uh, Geraldine, I didn't notice you at the beginning, but you suddenly turned up as well. So <laughs> I was on Facebook. <laughs> just, as we're, just as we're finishing, just as we're finishing. So no, I was on Facebook. Oh, you're on, you're watching on Facebook, so you thought you'd come in to join us, yeah. As another as another female voice in the mix, yeah. <laughs> That's why I came in when he asked. That's why you came in. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you'd like to answer the question as well for Julian as to how how you found it. You um, found I, it? I find it normally depends on the male leader of the group, depending on whether they listen to the women or not. Yeah. And I don't know if that helps, although Jesus was married, but then I find that with the leaders who are married, it tends to be on their relationship as well with their wives. If they have a good relationship, yeah. Yeah, so when I find that, when you find a leader, and I'm including you as well, Christian, a leader who gives the wife the opportunity to speak and be a part, they tend to give other women an opportunity as well. Yeah. To speak yes. and give it, yeah. give it. What do you think, Anne? Yeah, I, I, think, I, I definitely, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah but then when you find what uh, male leaders are like, no, 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 it's me, me, me. And the women ministry or the wives goes to a prayer at the end of the day, or just one woman's day in the 365 days, then there's no opportunity for women. Yeah, yeah. It's so funny it's when the, you give someone an opportunity to speak, isn't it? That, I mean, like a... Like if you went to go and find out what a minister's like and go and, or vice versa, a female minister and speak to the partner. But mm. I remember one guy that was involved, uh, he went to a church in Putney and he was asked to, you've got spiritual words for our congregation. Could you just give us a flavour of what's going on? And he said, um, oh, the left-hand side of the church, oh, it's lots of gold, love, peace, the spirit's really kicking off. And he went to the centre of the church. He said, not so much, but it, there's a lot of love here and stuff. <laughs> And then he came to the right side of the church. He said, oh, my word, it's so dark. And there, there's a lot of, that's where all the leaders were. <laughs> anyway, so they didn't call him back. <laughs> that's it. He got, he got Brilliant. Him. Well, before we, before we get into too much trouble with the with the stream on YouTube. I'll... <laughs> I was always I live, I forgot. Oh, yeah, we're, so getting, excited. Yeah, we're, we're streamed live. We, the, 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 you, you've, been spill, you've been spilling your beans all over the place. Yeah, forget all that. That's just allegedly. I was all those points. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I will. Um, I, I've. Yeah. Let, let's. Uh, we'll, we'll formally shut the meeting down. <laughs> it's been really lovely to be with you. It's been a long one today. It's been, but that's probably because it's been useful. Hopefully, so. Um, hopefully, it's been good for folks. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye.